that I've been asked by Maulana Jafar Abbas to make and it is that there is an exhibition of religious books. Now I was very thrilled to hear this because we need this exhibition very badly and the community to cultivate this spirit of attending these exhibitions is really enhancing its spirituality. People come to visit exhibitions in India from far afield. I know people recently traveled to New Delhi on a books exhibition. <coughs> Molana Jafrabas has organized under the auspices of Idare Alia, Tablir Ishad, uh, an exhibition of various books, and it's it's on from um, uh, 14th March to 24th March. That is the 29th of Dhul Hijjah to the 9th of Muharram and has books in English, Hindi and Gujarati language. The exhibition is open from 5 to 10 p.m. at Haji Muhammad Building, first floor, 115 Shaida Marg, Dongri, Mumbai. I, I urge you all, as far as will be possible for you, to attend this exhibition and partake in the view of the books. <coughs> Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in the name of Allah the merciful the compassionate all praises to Allah the creator of the universes and their sustainer the provider of believers and unbelievers and may his choicest blessings be on the seal of his prophets the last of his messengers and his holy progeny and in particular may his incessant blessings ever continue to flow on that fourth successor to the Holy Prophet, on Imam Zainul Abideen Ali ibn al Hussein, Salawatullahi wa Sallam. Yesterday we took some time to consider the Makarimul Akhlaq of Imam Zainul Abideen, alayhi salam. No pretense that we did it exhaustively, but at least we made a superficial study of some of his virtues so that we can learn from it, so that we can learn <clears throat> how to curb our anger, how to forgive each other, and how to be charitable to each other for a community in which anger is subdued, a community in which one brother is affectionate to another, <clears throat> and likewise among sisters, and a community in which one brother readily forgives another, and likewise with sisters, will inevitably result in the upliftment of that community. And that indeed is what the fourth Imam salam, would wish to see of our community. But it would be a great injustice to him if he being called Zainul Abideen, the ornament of worshippers, we should fail to consider his worship that resulted in that title. On Thursday night, we considered how he came to be known as Sayyidul Abideen and that that title came from heaven 
and it was delivered by the Holy Prophet himself. Well, we saw how Amir al-Mu'mineen addressed him in that way. Today, let us sit and see why he is called Sayyidu Sajideen. How did that come about? And his qualities of, of worship and spirituality, his level of ascetism. I said yesterday that if there is any Sufi, because I know even Sufis do not accept this as the final word, who believes that his <coughs> mission is on the prayer mat alone, that is not enough. The fourth Imam salam, taught the spirit of ascetism in the battleground of worldly activities. But that does not mean that when while one is enthralled in worldly activities and in helping Mu'mineen, etc., one does not need to be on the prayer mat. The teaching has always been that the prayer mat comes first. And I will not detain you on this subject because the proof of which, of the proof of this argument, I have already given you in 1999 when we were considering document 53. I remember too well then we looked at that passage in that letter of Hazrat Amir salam to Malik al Ashtar, and in that letter he says to Malik al Ashtar, O Malik, despite all this that I have told you to do, and he considered all aspects of government civil service, judiciary, executives, secretaries, army, police, all those were considered. And yet, despite all those burdens on Malik al-Ashtar, he says, you must devote a great period of your time and a period of your time which is the best of your time during the day. You must devote that entirely to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For then he says that because, O Malik, although all these other activities have thawab in them, helping each other, curbing your anger, each has thawab, great thawab in it. There is nothing that beats the thawab of true worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he says is of paramount importance. Whilst, whilst, all those activities carry their thawab, no doubt, an important thawab, thawab which we will see tonight, we need very badly. But he, said, he says to Malik al-Ashtar that when you say your wajib obligatory prayers, the thawab for one of those prayers that is accepted by Allah could be equal to 40 pilgrimages of a, of, of a haji whose hajj has been accepted. So you can see the importance of salah famous and only to, to, to remind you of them are the words of the Holy Prophet in respect of Salah. He says it is a Salah Amududdin <coughs> that it is the pillar of religion. So you can see without that religion drops all this religion that we discussed, charity, goodness etc. All that collapses if that pillar collapses. And then he says something even more significant. He says, As-salā amūd ad and then says, Man qubilat, qubilat ma siwaha, in qubilat, qubilat ma siwaha, wa in ruddat, ruddat ma siwaha. If your salah is accepted, then the rest of your amal are accepted. If your salah is rejected, then all your amals are rejected. And that is because the basis of all those amals must be for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And how can there be pleasure of Allah achieved when that prayer which He made obligatory is not, is not given serious, uh, serious consideration and serious time. And what better person for us from whom to learn how to spend those few moments on, on the prayer bed than one who is an ornament. Of, of worshippers. But because that concentration is required, because that, that exclusivity is required, when we are in communion with divinity to the exclusion of everybody else, and we discussed this last year when we discussed sayings of Imam Hussain salam, on this subject, hence I will not take your time again, but that exclusivity so that that time is devoted and 
exclusively for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demands as Hazrat Amir alayhi salam say to Malik al-Ashtar in that letter document number 53 in Nahjul Balagha he says choose the best of your time if the best of your time when you can concentrate on everything when your mind is clear when your power of concentration is at its best if that time is Fajr time indeed before Fajr then wake up at that time, leave your bed at that time, and concentrate in the worship of Allah at that time. But if evening is your better time for any reason, devote that time. But choose that time. Discipline is the border. Is the is the is the is the is the, is the, is the, is the, is the denominator there. Choose your time. Choose which is the best time. And this is the discipline that that letter of Hazrat Amir teaches. Having chosen that time, devote it and allocate it only to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The worship of uh, Imam Zainul Abideen alayhi salam is universally famous. There isn't an author who has written about it. Uh, I do not wish to take your time on, on citing a number of them. I wish to cite the leading Sunnite work on Imam Zainul Abideen alayhi salam. So that you can see that this is what a Sunnite writer writes. And, and he, he is certainly a very well-known writer, Kamaluddin Muhammad bin Talha. And he, in his book, Mubaligha, writes that when Imam Zainul Abideen salam, would stand up to make his wudu, his entire countenance, his face, would all go pale. He would become yellowish. <coughs> and when people who see that happening to him for the first time, and there was always people who saw that for the first time, members of his household became used to that. But his pilgrimages, his visits to the, to the mosques, they would be concerned about his health, would rush to him and say, Yabna Rasulillah, what is happening to you? And his answer would be glorious words. He says, this is my condition. As I see myself preparing myself to stand before him who has the might of sustaining the heavens and the earth, who is Jalal and who is Jabbar. That is the authority before whom I am preparing myself to address him. Well, what he says might be something all well known to us, but it is the appreciation. It is the appreciation of those words. We utter it as a ritual, not appreciating its meaning. But he is telling us that if we truly appreciated the meaning of those words and knew before whom we are standing for salah, we would have that condition also. And then, and then, Kamaluddin goes further to say that his color would change such that when he stood up, to say his first takbiratul ihram, one would see him trembling. And when asked what was happening, he would say, as I uttered those words, I said to myself, how dare I, this little humble thing, address the Lord of universes in the manner in which I do. And but for the fact that it is his order that I should address him in the way he has set out, I would not have dared address him in that way. tells us that the way I do my ruku, subhanAllah, 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 Allah Akbar, tells me very clearly that that is no salah at all. No salah at all. Of course, even that is important, I dare say, when there is shortage of time, because at least there is no sin for not having prayed. So at least the debits don't accumulate, our overdraft doesn't uh, uh, become in larger figures. So to that extent, even that is useful. But when we are talking of getting profit from it, getting thawab for it, what can we expect? And we as a community of businessmen don't want to do business in which there is no loss. We want to do business in which there is definite profit. Because that is the aim of any balance sheet, not merely balancing it. Well. When the prayers are over, he again indulges in sijda 
And those sajda, according to Shaykh Kamaluddin, Muhammad bin Talha, extend for hours on end. And I hope I'll come back to that aspect of the matter. And the second thing he says there is that those sajdas sometimes are in such deep concentration and so extensive that on one occasion as he was in sajda, having just completed his prayers, his house caught fire. And when there was fire, the family members became busy extinguishing the fire. They came to him and they shouted, Annar, Annar, fire, fire, so that he does not catch fire. When they realized that his room was going to be safe, they left him so that they extinguished the fire. They saw no hope of him leaving the sajda and come to, to help extinguish the fire. When that happened, he continued in his, in his, uh, in his uh, salah and in his sajda. When he finished the sajda and sat up, Household people came to him and said, you were engrossed in your sajda when the house was catching fire. The whole house would have been ablaze. And he said, and now what has happened? They said, well, we managed to extinguish the fire. Said he, and he says, yes, the fire that you were engrossed in and were worried about was the fire that would have demolished this house only. The fire that I was worried about in that sajda at that particular time was the fire of hell, the nar that I heard of. And as you kept saying nar, I said to myself that I am being reminded of the fire of hell. And that is what further extended my sajda, that Allah should, should spare me that fire of hell, which not only would extinguish my house, it would extinguish everything one owns, including one's spirit. But that was the mentality and personality of this person. Hands called Sayyidu Sajideen, his house could be on fire and he would not even know. Another incident of that nature that is recorded is that he was in the course of prayers and his, his son fell down and broke his arm and they wanted help. They found him in prayers asked for help, no response because his concentration in prayer is exclusively with Allah. He knows not what happened. And when the, and indeed this was at a dawn, and his sajda continued right up to the time when the sun had risen. So for hours he remained in prostration. We of course know this, we know this too well because on the eve of the 11th of Muharram in Karbala in 61 AH, after the tents were ablaze, Baby Zainab salam reports that Sayyidu Sajjad went into sajda and remained in sajda until it was fajr when he, when he got out of sajda so that he can say his fajr prayers. That was him. And in the morning then he is told that the son's hand had broken but then medical treatment was obtained for him. That is the concentration that he taught. But on one occasion, he was asked, and this is in um, the book of uh, Ibn Shahr Ashub, as related by the fifth Imam, Imam Muhammad Baqar, Salawatullahi wa Salamu Alayhi. And he says, on one occasion, he was saying his prayers in a mosque and his, his, his gown fell off on one side altogether. People who were praying with him thought that was unbecoming of uh, the grandson of the Prophet. His Abba had to be properly balanced. So when the prayers were over they went to him and said to him, look we saw this of your Abba. He says, when I say my prayers I have no conception of where my Abba is. I have no knowledge or thought of what is happening physically to me because physically and mentally my concentration is exclusively with Allah. How can you say to him, I worship you when you are thinking of what points you will argue tomorrow in a court case. It can't be and yet, and yet I am guilty of that. But 
that is the teaching from, from the fourth Imam alayhi salam. He said, how can I do that? How can I say, Subhana Rabbi al wa bihamdi? How can I say, you are so pure and so great, when my mind is not even there? Don't I mean what I say? And then he said something frightful, absolutely frightening. He said, that salah is not accepted by Allah if it is not in exclusive attention and concentration to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it stands to common sense. It stands to common sense. If, if I came here and started speaking to you, when my attention is elsewhere altogether, you would spot it in a minute. You would not only spot it in a minute, you would refuse to come and listen to me the next night. Likewise with Salah, why should Allah accept that? Of course, He is Arhamur Rahimin. Yes, that is what, that is what helps us in, in, in uh, obtaining some, some credit from Him. However, <coughs> the fourth Imam salam, says that is a condition for acceptance. Of course, sinning is different. It is not a condition for, for, for the performance of salah that there should be concentration. This is why you have the rules of, uh, of shakiyat and namaz. If you have a doubt, obviously if you have doubt means you are not concentrating. But those rules are made because it is not obligatory to, to concentrate. But that is one low standard. The standard of acceptance by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a different level altogether. And he says that level is not attained. Acceptance is not obtained. In other words, the pleasure of Allah is not obtained unless there is concentration. So the people around there say, Ibn Rasulullah, you have said things that frighten us. How, how do we pray then? Because we cannot pray the way you pray. All our, all our prayers in vain. And he says, no, they're not. They're not in vain. You are, there is provision for this. If you are not able to concentrate the way Salah needs concentration, the cure and remedy for it is Nafala. Recite the Sunnah. Na, salah also, the well-known nafilas that we, 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 we inshallah recite, the eight rakat before dhuhr, the eight rakat before asr, the four rakat after maghrib, the one rakat after isha, and the eleven of the hajjud and two before fajr. <coughs> he says those nafila are very important because those nafila then make up the deficiencies in our salah and our salah becomes acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fantastic that not only should he teach us the right way of doing it, but if we cannot attain it, also teach us the remedy for, for doing what is right. Ahmad bin Ibn Hajar Bakki, in his book Sawai Ke Mahrika, I keep quoting it because I say it's written against the Shias. He says in that book that it is known of uh, Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam that he recited a thousand rakat in every 24 hours. Every day and night he would finish a thousand rakat. And this comes not from a friend of Ahlul Bayt. I tend to cite these authorities so that the youth does not feel, as some youths in the western countries feel, that all these are exaggerations. Because they do not see the like of it, they feel that maybe all this is exaggeration. My pain and effort is to show that there is no exaggeration in this. People who saw him do it and who witnessed it have written in their books, although they were enemies of Ahlul Bayt And not in one book, in numerous books. And till today, ulama of various sects, of all the sects of Islam, refer to him as Zainul Abidin or Sayyidul Abidin. That was the level at which he was. Imam Muhammad Baqir sallallahu alayhi says <coughs> that in his farm, the fourth Imam alayhi salam had 500 palm trees, date palms. Well again, people ask how did they maintain themselves? He was an agriculturalist. He grew trees and sold the, the produce and made money that way. The money that you hear he would, for example, yesterday's Usama's case, saying, I will settle your debt, did not come except through sweat and hard, and hard labor. And 
the fifth Imam salam, says he would go at each palm tree and recite two rakat namaz. By the time he has done that for 500 palm trees, he has already accumulated 1,000 rakat. But you can imagine how clever that was. Not only did it raise his, uh, his, his, his spirituality, his ascetism at that level, but it also gave baraka to his produce. And he says that even those salah that he recited, in each one of them his color would change. By the time he would finish 500 trees, the Imam Muhammad Bakr would say, I would be concerned about his health, but I would still find him walking erect and, and, and proceeding on his duties. That is how he conducted his affairs. His color changing all the time, entirely out of the awe of Allah. The more you know Allah, the more you are in awe of Allah, the less you would sin. These are easy propositions to, to enunciate, but propositions that they're not only taught in sentences, they taught them in practice. And this is why it was important that after the Holy Prophet, he should be succeeded by successors who would keep that sunnah of the Holy Prophet going. Else Islam would have been lost. And that is why we say that Islam has survived because of these A'imma alayhimu salam, whether they were physically in Khilafah or not. That was irrelevant. What was relevant was the saving of Islam. The Islam that we have today. The Islam that the Sunnites have today is because of them. Otherwise, where would Yazid have taken the Ummah? Where would Marwan have taken the Ummah? Where would the, 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 the Abbasid Khalifs have taken the Ummah? Where drinking and uh, sins were committed openly in the courts of these Khalifs? Well, Imam Zayn al-Abideen salam taught that all this is not acceptable. There must be salah and it must be with such concentration that Allah would accept it. Indeed, his prostrations became so famous that he was known as Sajjad. It is said that the, the, the parts of the body affected by Sajda, particularly the forehead and the knees, would swell to such an extent that they would become as hard as the knee of a camel. And twice a year, the skin from his knee would have to be cut so that the knee maintains its balance. You can see the extent to which it caused him trouble and pain. Yet all that did not matter. What mattered was that he should make sajda. Asked about this, the fifth Imam salam said he would make sajda on every occasion. He would read an ayah of Quran which required sujda, of course he would make it. He would read an ayah of Quran which shows the na'mah, the blessings of Allah on humanity, the mercy of Allah on humanity, and he would immediately make a sujda of shukr. He would read about, about the blessings on the, on the Holy Prophet, he would make a sujda straight away. He would have done some good, like giving charity to people, and he would make sujda straight away of shukr. He would have made sulh, settlement between two parties who were quarreling and he would make a sajda straight away. And why not? Because it is he who has taught us that to make shukr itself requires tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have to make shukr of Allah that you are able to make his shukr. That is his level of ascetism. To be grateful to Allah that we can be grateful to him. Indeed. How, how ungrateful would that person be who wouldn't be grateful to Allah? And yet he says, because that requires, that requires sentiment from Allah, it requires inspiration from Allah, we have firstly to thank Allah for being thankful to Him. That is his teaching in Saif al sajadiyah And so it came that he became called Sayyidu Sajjad, Say, Sayyidu Sajideen. But an interesting point about his sajdahs is that he would carry with him a small purse and in the purse he had the grave, he had the earth from the grave of his father. Of course he would have because he visited the grave of his father just before leaving for Medina. He had that in his purse and every time he said his prayers, he said he made his sajdah on that earth from the grave of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. So what we are doing today is no bid'ah, apart from the fact 
It is nothing new. This is the God that we use, made of earth from Karbala, was his sunnah. Of course, for that earth, which is from actual grave of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, the kind of earth that the fourth Imam alayhi salam used. For that sort of earth, the hadith is that if you make sajda on that earth, there is no sajda of that nature that Allah would not accept. That earth itself would provide would provide acceptance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the kind of sajda that he made. In fact, his prostrations and his prayers went so far, so far, that members of his family were worried. Sheikh Abbas Kumi in Muntah al-Amal sets out uh, an episode <coughs> from Fatima, the daughter of Hazrat Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam. According to Sheikh Mufid, Hazrat Amir's last daughter was called Fatima. And she became so worried because such deep constant prayers all the time made the Imam alayhi salam physically so weak. Her going to speak to the Imam alayhi salam would not have helped. In fact, it would have been audacious for her to speak to a personality of that stature. But whom should, he, should she resort to? She decided she would call Jabir. Because Jabir by then was not only an elderly gentleman, a respected wise gentleman, he was also the most renowned of the companions of the Holy Prophet who was still alive. Indeed, they were just a a handful of them by then. She calls Jabir and says, Oh Jabir, look at the state of uh, Ali ibn al-Hussein alayhim as -salam. All this because of his deep worship. He commits no sins. He is a hujjatullah. He has done nothing that would make him accountable to Allah. He has got so much for which he would be rewarded by Allah. And we don't say he should not make his sajdas, we don't say he should not pray, but reduce them a little, so that his health does not deteriorate as it does. <coughs> the Abid says, you're quite right. I will make sure that I convey this to him. So, Bibi Fatima alayhi salam says, but do it in your own name. Jabir says, yes, I will. And Jabir approaches Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam. An interesting piece of uh, uh, discussion, I thought. And Jabir sets out all this and says, you don't need all this. And Allah is merciful after all. He does not expect all this from you. And the reply that Imam Zain al-Abideen gives is so glorious. He says, oh Jabir, you have seen my grandfather, the Holy Prophet himself. May peace be upon him and his progeny. And you saw how he worshipped. Allah, and we know this because Quran kept saying to keep kept saying to the Holy Prophet, Kumil do certainly wake up at night, but but for a short period, do not keep your prayers for as long as you do, because the prayers of the Holy Prophet, as is well known, would last the whole night. As we have seen, was the case with Imam Zain al Abidin alayhi salam also. He cited that to Jabir and says to Jabir, I am supposed to be his successor. I am as answerable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as the Holy Prophet was. And if anything short of that would have been alright for the Holy Prophet, then only would it be alright for me. So long as it was not good enough for him, and he prayed all night the way he did, it is incumbent upon me also to do likewise. I found this an interesting answer. But let me finish the episode before I come back to that discussion. So Jabir says, yes, all that is correct. But Allah also asked him to reduce. And he says, yes, but the Prophet continued in his, in his, in his lengthy prayers. And, and Jabir says, yes, that is true. But you've got to look after your health. Because the Muslims need you. A very common argument. We have said this to our, some of our leaders. The community needs you. If you go because of your ill health, who will look after this ummah? Who will give us all these teachings, lessons, etc.? We need them and we need you as a result. He finishes the conversation. He winds it up by saying, Oh Jabir, let me live a life the way my ancestors lived so that when I meet my Lord, I meet Him the way they have met Him. 
what more evidence do we need to prove that statement of the Holy Prophet in which he said, Awwaluna Muhammad, Awsatuna Muhammad, Akhiruna Muhammad, Kulluna Muhammad. Hence do we say that these 12 that we are talking about are not personalities at random. They are in a golden chain that flows from one after the other, each no ounce lesser in its carrots than the one that preceded it. <coughs> and he continues, he continues his life in that fantastic way. Yesterday we saw how his ibadah in charities went so that nobody would even know who, what he has given and whom he has given. And let us just touch on his pilgrimages because he did 25 pilgrimages. But 20 of them he did with one camel. Of course, he walked. He went on, on pilgrimage by foot and questioned. He would say, as you remember the words of Imam Hassan alayhi salam, he would say identically as his, 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 as his uncle would say. He would turn around and say, I am ashamed to go to the house of that Lord that sustains me and supports me. How can I ride and go to his house? I must go to his house by foot. But he, can, he had his camel with him. despite. And indeed it is said that going by foot took him 20 days between Medina and Makkah. And this is in Sunnite sources. He would make a 20 day journey to, to cover that distance. Well, the three and a half hours that we now take between Medina and Makkah, we also find rather lengthy. We were finding means of shortening even that, even that journey. He would take 20 days because each step gave him that thawab. And it is said that in respect of that camel, he did not hit a, that camel with a cane even once. Even once he did not use a camel. <coughs> he did not use a cane, a whip. On one occasion, the camel wouldn't move at all. Wouldn't move at all. And he was tempted to use the whip and raised it. And the moment he raised it, he said, Al-Qisas, Al-Qisas, oh retaliation, oh retaliation, and dropped the whip. Retaliation on the day of judgment, that if he whips the camel, he might become liable to be whipped on the day of judgment. Glorious lesson to us, how when these emotions, particularly anger, anger at this time, when the camel wouldn't move, come in our way, what answers do we have immediately? That thought, that one would be answerable to it, in single word, al qisas and that was enough to stop him from whipping that camel. Indeed, it is said when that camel died, he even buried the camel. <clears throat> and when asked why he was taking the trouble to bury the camel, because it is not usual to do so, <clears throat> he said, well, what is usual is that other beasts come and feed on these camels. I do not want this camel which served me to be fed on by other beasts. I will bury it in safety. That was his level of ibadah. And indeed, and this is written in all, in all uh, Sunnite books as well as ours, when he would be ready to wear his ihram. And as you all know, he had to recite his talbiyah, his color would change. He would not be able even to recite the talbiyah. People would come to him and say, Ibn Rasulullah, we did not wear our ihram until you did. We cannot recite talbiyah until you have. And sobbingly he would turn to them and say, I am not able to say labbaik, Allahumma labbaik. They said, but you have just uttered those words. You can say them. He says, yes, I can say them to you. But I dare not say them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lest there should be a voice from divinity to say, la labbaik alaka, la sa'daik. There is no labbaik for you. There is no sa'daik for you. There is no good fortune for you. Lest I be rejected. I say labbaik. If he rejected me, what of me? And having said that, he would become unconscious. Different groups with him every year, they would wait until he would gain consciousness. And with great difficulty, would he ultimately recite the talbiyah and say, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik, with cries, sobs, tears from his eyes, so that Allah may not reject him. 
That was the level of his ascetism, the level of his of his of his irfan, of his knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when he is seen in Kaaba, when he is seen going round the Kaaba, he is seen going round like the most humblest of pilgrims going round that holy house. And he would be in his prayers, thanks to those narrators who have left some of those prayers for us, so that we can make use of them. And we too, alhamdulillah, make use of those prayers when we go around. Beautiful prayers. Beautiful prayers at each place. When you start your tawaf, prayer taught by him, when you come to the door, prayer taught by him, and what a beautiful prayer. I was saying to myself, I will not indulge in these prayers, because if we start discussing the prayers of Imam Sajjad Islam, the nights will be over before the topics become over. But just this short one, when he moves at the door, he says, Sa'iluka bibabik, miskinuka bibabik, here is your 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 beggar on your at your door your 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 poor beggar at your door give him your jannah give him your jannah entirely as a as as as, as a sadqa purely as a sadqa from you and what a great thing for him for allah to give someone heaven purely as a sadqa prayer taught by him what comes round to the to the Hajri Ismail, he turns round and the prayer is Najini min an nar. Oh my sustainer, save me from the fire of hell. Indeed, uh, a leading uh, in a leading uh, Sunnite writer, Tawus Yamani, in his book, he wrote a book when he did a pilgrimage with uh, with uh, Sayyid Sayyid Sayyid, 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 Sayyid Abidin. He wrote a book on it, and he says one night. I saw him performing his usual tawaf at every turn, pleading to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when the night became a little dark, and majority of the people had left, there were just a handful of people left in the well of the Kaaba. I saw him enter the Hijr. I also followed him quietly in the Hijr. He touched the Kaaba and recited a dua, then in sajda, and that sajda of course lasted till Fajr. So I wanted to hear what is this man saying in his in sajda. Words that have become proverbial, indeed proverbial, which we use all the time. The words are Obeiduka bifanaik, miskinuka bifanaik, faqiruka bifanaik. Here is a little creature, a little slave of yours who has come to your courtyard. Your beggar who has come to your courtyard, a poor man who has come to your courtyard, Sta'usa Yamani says, and this is without recognizing him as a Hujjatullah, Ta'usa Yamani says, I was so impressed by those words, they got so stuck in my mind that never did I have a haja when I did not call Allah in those words. And I recall no event when I when I called invoked Allah by those words and my haja was not fulfilled. And my haja was not fulfilled. You can see the barakah of these words. Hence do we tell the youths, don't forsake the Arabic words of the Imams alayhi salam. Of course read the translations. Of course know what they are saying. Because what is the point otherwise? Dua'i Kumail for example is beautiful, of, full of these lofty, lofty words, each having become proverbial because of the way in which those passages are, are prepared. But kept in their context and in the balance of their expressions. They carry great communication ascetism to reach them to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how he performed his, his, his hajj. And indeed one can see that in each of these ibadat there is that root depth of pleasure of Allah to be attained at all stages. I move on to start on the political acumen of uh, Sayyid Sayyid, Sayyid, Sayyid Sajideen today because I fear tomorrow we may not be able to complete them all. <coughs> I know I'm cutting short our discussions on his ibadat, but never did I dream that I would be able to give uh, an exhaustive treatment to his, his ibadat. I don't see any 
leave alone me, any scholar being able to do it in, in, in a sitting or so. But moving on to his, uh, to his uh, political acumen, I'd like to put his political life in one sentence. And it is this, that his political mission was to continue the mission of his father, Imam Hussain alayhi salam. And what wonder, what wonder, we keep doing this all the time. To give you one example, which is homely, when Gandhi was assassinated in this country, what did the, the survivors say? That Mahatma, we will continue your mission. Whenever a leader of a country is martyred for his cause, the successes immediately say, that cause is dear to us. And we will continue the cause after you. Imam Zainul Abidin did no less than that. But the fantastic thing about him, of course, was that that mission started the very day after Ashura. He didn't leave one day unattended to that cause. And it was an important cause. Well, <coughs> I wish to embark on that this evening straight away. So that tomorrow I deal with five wars, five battles that he witnessed. The, the Battle of Hurra, which I touched on last night, when Marwan had to run away from Medina. The uprising in, uh, in, in, in Makkah of uh, Abdullah bin Zubair, which I touched on last year when we were discussing Mukhtar, and will now carry forward, because I then did say that we may be able to carry forward that subject when we are discussing Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam. So that will have to be dealt with. And then there is the, 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 the episode of Marwan, that battle in which Marwan comes to power. Fourthly, that is the uprising of the Tawabur, the Sayyid bin Sur. We touched on him when we were discussing Mukhtar last year, but we left him aside. Let's proceed with him a little tomorrow. And of course, Mukhtar, all those events of Mukhtar. Why was the Imam salam, not in the forefront? Why was he not involved in those battles personally? What did he think of all that that was going on? All that tomorrow, inshallah, if the clock will permit. But to start off, I, and I want to start off pretty speedily, because these are areas I have covered. The first, the first speech he makes after Karbala was in the bazaar of Kufa. It is fantastic. It's a, it's, it's a speech which was impromptu. In the bazaar of Kufa, he makes that speech. They were being lined up so that people see who they are. See who these rebels were, the son of Hussein who wanted to rebel against Yazid. And <coughs> to be paraded like prisoners of war. That was the essence of that exercise. How Imam Zainul Abidin converted it all into a, 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 into a speech-making congregation, a convocation at which he addressed addressed uh, the entire audience that was there. Of course, Bibi Zainab salam had addressed in her way. But the topics he chose, I will not take you into the whole speech. And I make the excuse that I have already done so. And I did so on the 29th of May, 1997, when I was discussing the journey from Karbala to Damascus. I appreciate that on 29th May, 1997, some of you may not have been here. Some of you may not have started joining us. So if there is need for me to repeat that speech, I will. But for the moment, I will only say two or three things about that speech. The acumen with which he turned those people was absolutely fantastic. Show me the best of politicians. Show me Caesar. Show me Cicero. Show me Crusho. Were they able to move people in that way? He turned around to them in one simple argument and said, Aren't you the people who wrote letters to my father and in those letters invited him to come to you so that you follow him and you then turned against him? Your husbands, your brothers, your fathers gathered in Karbala to kill him and ultimately slaughtered him the way you did without thirst? The whole crowd changed and they began to weep. And he said, those letters that each one of you have written are extant with me today. My father has left them. Of course, he had produced them to Hur, you remember? We discussed last year. He produced them at the, at the dawn of, of Ashura, Imam Hussain alayhi salam himself. Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam says, those letters are with me. And went on to praise Imam Hussain alayhi salam, went on to quote the ahadith 
of, uh, of uh, the Holy Prophet about Imam, about Imam Hussein salam, singling out companions of the Prophet from the crowd, saying, you were there when the Holy Prophet said it, he was not even born. It became impossible for those companions to, to, to deny. The whole color of that, of that audience changed from those who were rejoicing the victory of, of Yazid were in that very bazaar now weeping and lamenting over the martyrdom of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. But the classic and classical political acumen of uh, Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam is shown in his next step. When people got into this step, into this stage, they turned round to him and said, Yabna Rasulillah, extend your hand if you like, extend your foot. We will kiss your feet and make bay'ah to you now. We want to make bay'ah for you now. Now that was the most glorious victory of Imam Zainul Abideen alayhi salam. Imam Hussein alayhi salam was called over from Medina so that he makes bay'ah of Yazid. He didn't. On the contrary, his son is now being offered by, uh, by the very ummah that was prepared to make bayah to Yazid. The tables were turned all together. But would Imam Zainul Abidin accept that bayah? A lesser politician would have said, yes, and make the two fight amongst themselves. Now, Yazid will have a rebellion. He will have a mutiny. His own people fighting him. Yes, but Imam Zainul Abideen alayhi salam's foresight was, 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 was longer than that and deeper than that. He, 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 having counted his chicken immediately, he rejected that bayah. He said, I do not want your bayah at all. <coughs> the Kufis turned around to him and said, Yabn Rasulillah, are we so bad that you do not even accept our bayah when you have not asked for bayah? That's the glorious point. You have not asked for bayah. We are giving it to you voluntarily. And he turned around to them and said, What use is your bayah? And how can I trust your bayah? Are you not the people who made bayah to my grandfather Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam? And went against him in, and killed him ultimately? Are you not the ones who made bayah of my uncle Hassan alayhi salam? And ultimately killed him? Are you not the lot who called my father Imam Hussein alayhi salam? So that... So that uh, he, he should lead you to the right path and ultimately kill him, hungry and thirsty this time? Do I now have any good reason for accepting bay'ah from you? What a religious, a spiritual reason for declining the bay'ah. Who can blame him for declining that bay'ah? He found them unworthy of bay'ah. The political background to it would be that if he had accepted bay'ah at that time, history would have been changed in its color today. History would have said Imam Hussein salam, did not go to save Islam. He wanted to get bay'ah of the people. He did not make bay'ah. He wanted bay'ah. If he was killed, his son took bay'ah in Kufa. But he crushed that argument. He left the blood of his father, Imam Hussein salam, as pure and as sacrosanct as it possibly could be to be such that it, it, it evokes inspiration of spirituality till today and becomes the cause of salvation in the hereafter. That was deep acumen of uh, Imam Zain al-Abideen alayhi salam. And he changed the people. The people realized where truth lay and where falsehood was, where purity lay and where scandalism lay. And from there, and I'm jumping, jumping very quickly because his speech in the, in the court of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad in Kufa, is in itself, is in itself a marvelous one, worthy of your time. Again, I make the excuse that I've discussed it on 29th May 1997, and I'm sure uh, uh, records of it are available. However, and if need be, I will, I will happily take time to, to restate them. Then when in the, in the bazaar of Damascus, just as he did in the bazaar of Kufa, so in the bazaar of Damascus, there again, people here were in worse shape because at least in Kufa people knew Ahlul Bayt. In Syria they never knew Ahlul Bayt. They were under Muawiyah for years, years on end. But Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam created a situation in which not only did they come to know who he was, what Islam was, he all, they also came to know the ladies who were there with them. 
And one instance that I might set before you, although I think I have cited that also to you on the 1st of June 1997, including the speech that he made in the court of, of Damascus. But that old man coming to him and saying, a worthy old man, wise looking old man, pious old man whom the Syrians would follow. He comes to him and says, I thank of Allah that you people have been humiliated by Allah. The kind of words that Ubaidullah would use. And, 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 uh, and the, the rebel, the, the rebellion you wanted to make has been crushed. So, <clears throat> Imam Zainul Abidin turns to him and says, O oh, Sheikh, O oh, old man, have you read the Quran? Because the Imam knew that he was a Qari. He says, yes, I have read the Quran very well. In fact, some hadith say that he was a Hafiz, that he knew Quran by heart. However, but he certainly was a Qari, he was a reciter of Quran. So the Imam salam, says, have you read that, that ayah in Quran which says, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ أَجْرًا إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَى Tell them, O Holy Prophet, that I do not seek any recompense from you except love for my Ahlul Bayt, for my family. He says, yes, I know that I are very well. It is for the family of our Prophet. And Imam Zainul Abidin salam, says, O Shaykh, we are the family of the Prophet. We who you see in this condition are the family of the Prophet. And then he says, but O Shaykh, have you read that ayah which says, Wa'ati dhil qurba haqqahu? Give my family their rights. And they were, those rights have been uh, wrenched out from them at every stage of history. Quran says that. So he says, Is this how you give us our rights? When Quran says, Wa'ati dhil qurba haqqahu? And the old man still doesn't believe and says, So you are Ahlul Bayt. And Imam Zainul Abidin says, yes, we are Ahlul Bayt. And then turns around and recites that ayah of Khums. Says that Zil Qurba to whom Khums is to go is we, we are the Ahlul Bayt. And then recites that famous ayah, Innama Yuridullahu Liyuthibankum Urrijz Ahlul Bayt wa Yutahirakum Tatahira. And when he declares the purity of Ahlul Bayt, he turns round to him and says, Oh old man, you want to know who Ahlul Bayt is? Look at that head there. That is the head of Hussein ibn Ali alayhi salam. And the old man looks at it and says, What a resemblance between you and him. And he turns round and says, These captives don't think they are prisoners of war. They are my family. There is Zaynab in it, the daughter of Ali ibn Abi Talib. There is Kulthum in it, the daughter of, 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 of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Mentioned Sukaina and says, this is a four-year four daughter of Hussein ibn Ali salam. Is this the way they are taken? And you know too well. We have discussed this the, the last part. He immediately says, give me permission that I also die in the path of your father. Takes a sword from one of the soldiers there starts to make a battle, but he is immediately killed. All that Imam Zainul Abideen alayhi salam says, Oh Shaykh, may Allah have mercy on you. My father went on the body of each of his companions when they fell. You fall here for him. I am in chains. I am not able to come down and come to your body. Allah will have mercy on you. My grandfather will accept you. Indeed, Imam Zainul Abideen alayhi salam, with what magnanimity introduced the Ahlul Bayt to them. It was the 28th of Rajab when that kafila left for, 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 for Makkah and when they left for Medina with what dignity they left talking of Umm Kulthum when she was to get into on, on, onto her, onto her uh, into the caravan Hazrat Abbas alayhi salam drew a curtain so that nobody should see Umm Kulthum there. Indeed, when Bibi Zainab alayhi salam was to mount the, 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 the caravan and the stool that was brought by Shahzad Ali Akbar became small, Imam Hussein alayhi salam himself knelt and it is on the knees of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Then Bibi Zainab alayhi salam was mounted. This is why, this is why that that mounting became so important. But indeed, when Imam Zainul Abideen introduced that family, 
<laughs> that family had been mounted on barren camels without any mountings on them at all and rushed from place to place. They were at that time already tied in their ropes, a number of women in one rope, one rope all together, all of them living in that stage. And as Imam Hussain alayhi salam left Medina, the crying little girl, Fatima Sukhra, turned around in lamentation, saying to, his, to her father, Oh father, how will I now live in this empty house? On the last occasion, the wasiyah, again goes to say this Sajjad saying oh Ali when you go back tell Fatima I did not forget her tell my daughter Fatima that I did not forget her time did not give me an opportunity to write to her tell her that I have thought of her and I pray for her even at this last moment that I have with you Alhamdulillah <laughs> إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون رحم الله من يكره الفاتحة